Hi guys, um, you should go ahead and watch this after you go ahead and watch the uh, Bozeman science video on simple machines. I think it's a good companion to go with that one. So today we're going to do a real brief overview of the simple machine since you already have seen it. And we're going to go ahead and kind of give you some insight to how it relates to complex machines and give you a little bit more detail about how those different simple machines make work easier so to speak. Now, be careful with that term easier, but we'll talk about how we use them as a machine. So question number one, what are the six main types of simple machines? So if we can just think about them back to like Leonardo da Vinci's works, these are kind of the basic list. Uh, there are many lists that add more simple machines to this list, but we're gonna focus on these six basic ones. Number two, how does each of the simple machines make work easier? And again, I put that in quotes. That's not a very scientific term, but why do we use the machine? What does it do for us? And then number three, how does a complex machine relate to a simple machine? Now, before we jump in looking at the simple machines themselves, I want to do a quick review of work. Okay, we went over work and power, and work is a force used to make something move. So it's work equals force times distance. And the unit that we talked about is joule, which is the same unit used to measure energy. And then if we look at power, that's a joule per second, which is going to be a watt, okay? But today we're gonna to go ahead and think about this in terms of machines. So in the simplest form, a machine is a device with which you can do work in a way that is easier or more effective. Now there are two primary categories for these machines. You can have a simple machine, which is what we're gonna focus on here, or a complex machine, and you can see complex machines all around you. You're using one right now. There are three different ways that a machine makes work easier. One, by changing the amount of force you exert. Okay? So if you're gonna make more force over a longer distance or do a longer, um, less force over a longer distance or more force over a shorter distance. Or B, change the distance over which you exert the force. Because remember, when we think about these, we're relating force and distance to work. Or C, the direction in which you exert the force. I have a great example, this is the pulley we'll talk about. You can use an assist from gravity to pull down to get an object to go up. So you typically probably think of machines as a very complex gadget with running on electricity, but a machine is as simple as a shovel or even a ramp that you walk up to, to get to a door. So by definition, when work is done with a force applied and the result movement over a set distance, the work done is the product of the force times the distance, that's, that's our equation that we already gave you, and the amount of work required to achieve a set of objective is constant. So there's one thing that we really need to kind of keep in mind when we're dealing with machines that Again, we're kind of doing that whole spherical cow thing that we've talked about before, like we did when we neglected air resistance. We're trying to get an understanding of the system and it's not exactly perfect in terms of our understanding. So one of the big things I want you to keep in mind as we start looking at this is this idea of work in equals work out. Okay, so in terms of work coming in, if we think about force times distance, this is gonna be equal to the force times distance. So force in, force out, okay? So this relationship should hold true as long as there's no problems with efficiency, but we should all know there's always problems with efficiency. There is no machine that is 100% efficient, it doesn't exist. And so we have to think about that, that these calculations that we do when we start looking at work in versus work out, they're based on the ideal situation, okay? So a simple device is simply any device that requires the application of only single force to make it work. All right, so Let's continue to move on and take a look at the different types of simple machines. Now, there are typically six that show up when we start looking back at the Da Vinci era and the main ones that can be applied or amplified into different actions. One is the inclined plane. Okay, two, the wheel and axle. 
three, the lever, which is going to be a big one. We'll talk about several different iterations. Number four, the pulley. Number five, the wedge, which is going to split something apart. And number six, the screw. Now these can often be categorized into two different categories, either the inclined plane or the lever. And so kind of keep an eye out for that as you go through and start looking at these different six categories. The first one we want to take a look at is the wheel and axle. Now the axle is a rod that goes through the wheel, which allows the wheel to turn. Uh, gears are a form of wheels and axles. So when we start thinking about applying this, we're going to go ahead and change uh, the type of friction instead of having sliding friction or trying to have something dragging across the other, you reduce the amount of friction by creating rolling friction. And so this is one of the big benefits, but you do still have friction. You think about cars, you think about bicycles. Those are some examples of things that are going to apply wheel and axle, but you could use any type of gear system as well. The next we have is pulleys. Pulleys are wheel and axles with a groove around the outside that has a rope going over it or a chain or something of the sort. Uh, this allows us to change the direction in which they are applying force. So if you think about a wheel and axle, we're limiting the amount of friction by going ahead and switching to a rolling or rotating object. In this case, we're using that same concept, but we're gonna change the direction in which the force is being applied. We're gonna allow a pull to go ahead and pull something up, we'll pull down, these types of things. Very helpful when you're trying to do something like uh, to go on a sailing boat. You don't have to climb to the top of the mast to pull the rope up and over. Instead, you pull down, the sail goes up. Okay, the next is an inclined plane. Now that could be something like stairs. This is why stairs are easier than ladders, uh, or it could be just a simple ramp. It, inclined planes make the work of moving things easier. When we look at a sloping surface like a ramp, uh, this alters the effort and distance involved in doing the work, such as lifting a load. The trade-off is that the object must be moved a longer distance than if it was just lifted straight up, but we use less force in order to go ahead and do this. Um, you can use this machine to go ahead and move an object to a lower or higher place. Inclined planes make the work of moving things easier. Uh, you'd need a lot less energy and force to move objects with an inclined plane. The next one is when we go ahead and start looking at a wedge. Now a wedge is really just two inclined planes placed back to back. And so if we take a look at this, okay, if I have a sideways inclined plane here and then place another one right next to it, okay, it ends up coming to a point and we use this to go ahead and shift the force to break something apart. Okay, you think about this when we go ahead and start looking at everything from a door stop to a kitchen knife to a cutting ax that you see here. And similarly, uh, another one that's kind of in this category is the screw. Now a screw is going to have an inclined plane that is wrapped around a central cylinder so that we can turn rotational force into vertical force. And when we go ahead and take a look at this, there are three parts to a screw. When you take a look at a screw, you've got the head, which is this part up here at the top, head. You've got the shaft, which is the main portion. And then you have the tip down here at the end. Tip is what allows it to go ahead and catch in the material so that we can get that inclined plane that's around the screw to catch before it starts pulling and transferring the motion of circular motion into vertical motion. The last category and the one I wanna spend the most time on is that of levers. Now, <clears throat> typically in most classification schemes, you'll take a look at three types of levers, a first class, second class, and third class lever. Each of these three types of levers has four basic parts. The force, where you're applying the force, we typically have been calling it the applied force, but this in terms of simple machines would be the force in. You have the fulcrum, which is the support point that balances the whole system. The beam or the arm where we go ahead and connect the two sides of the lever. And then for the load, this is what you're trying to lift or to move. 
Okay, so let's start by taking a look at first class levers. Now, a first class lever is one in which the fulcrum is loaded, located between the input force and the output bar, which causes the lever to rotate or move up and down on the fulcrum. This lifting the resistance force on the opposite side. In a first class lever, the fulcrum's in the middle and the load and effort are on either side and you're typically going to be pushing downward. So think of like a seesaw, uh, you go down on one side, it pushes up the other side. You push to that side down and the other side goes up, okay? So this is a perfect example of a first class lever. Now, when we switch to the other lever types, pay close attention to where the fulcrum ends up. This is going to be a big, important piece of understanding the difference between the three types of levers. All right, so a second class lever, you'll notice that the load has changed to be in between the applied force and the fulcrum. Okay, a great example of this would be a wheelbarrow. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna go ahead and lift the load that's in the wheelbarrow, and then the front of it is going to be sitting on the tire, which is gonna go ahead and move forward. Okay, the last of these is going to be the third level, third class lever. Um, this fulcrum is at the one end, just like the wheelbarrow we saw before, but instead our force is going to be applied in between the fulcrum and the load. Okay, this is a good example as a baseball bat. So when you swing, you've got the one arm on top that's gonna to go ahead and act as the force applying arm. You've got the fulcrum, which is gonna be your bottom hand. And then you've got the load, which is gonna be the bat swinging that's gonna eventually hit the baseball. Okay, notice that the input force moves through a shorter distance than the output of the load. Okay, this is a key piece. So if we think about that relationship of force times distance, okay, in terms of the work we're doing, we're covering a shorter distance. So in order to go ahead and get that, we have to apply greater force if we're gonna have more work done, okay? But there's a lot of examples of this. You can start thinking about swinging anything uh, or any sort of racket is going to rely on this kind of um, motion, we start thinking about golf clubs, all of these are going to fall into this category. So let's take a minute and try and identify what these simple machines are. So we have, you can number them one through six. Um, we will go ahead and start going over them one at a time. Um, maybe you just do a quick little sketch and we can identify them. All right, so you've got one in the top left, and then I'll just go across the top, I think, and then do the bottom ones after that. So pause the video here, write down what these different simple machines are, and then we'll go ahead and double check if you get them right. So pause the video here. Okay, welcome back. You got them written down. Let's take a look. So this first one, he's going ahead and putting some wood underneath the tire and snow to try and get it out of being stuck most likely. And so this is going to end up being actually, even though it looks like a lever, more of what we'd call an inclined plane. Okay, because what he's trying to do is to try and put that force over a longer distance so less force is required. All right, so as we move to the right, I bet you guys all got this one right. This is your wheel and axle. And here, if we're gonna go ahead and hammer a spike in like that uh, using a mallet of any type, uh, we use these to split wood, wood splitters. Okay, this is gonna be a wedge. The next one, again, pretty straightforward because the it's the name of what we're looking at. This is a screw. We've got a pulley system here. And lastly, we've got another inclined plane as we go up the ramp. Now, we've been talking about simple machines. What about complex machines? Well, anytime you have two or more of these together, you have already a complex machine. So two or more simple machines working together makes a complex machine. So something like a car jack which combines a wedge and a screw. We're putting it underneath the car and we're using a screw to raise it so that we can get a gap. A crane or tow truck combines a lever and a pulley, pulley system so we can get it up, but there's also a lever so we can pull on it as well. Wheelbarrow combines a wheel and axle with a lever. So these are all great examples that we can go ahead and use to help us better understand how we use complex and simple machines in our daily lives. And it doesn't have to be just two working together. We can make very complex things like the computer we're working on or 
maybe let's say something like a tank. There are tons of examples. You might take a minute to pause the video and see if you can identify how many different simple machines can be found in this one image of the tank. Okay, how many did you get? Be interested to know. Go ahead and put it in the comments. And lastly, we'll finish up with our summary. What are the six simple machines and how do they make work, quote unquote, easier? So the wedge pushes materials apart or cuts. So you're applying a vertical force uh, by putting it at a small point and using the bigger back portion of the wedge to go ahead and push the two parts apart. Uh, the wheel and axle makes it easy to move things by rolling them. This reduces friction. The lever helps us to lift heavy weights by either using longer distances or if we're thinking about like a hockey puck, right? We're going to use a lot of force over a short distance to get a really long slap. And when we go ahead and start talking about momentum and impulse, we'll take a look at how much we can end up applying in terms of momentum. Uh, then we have the inclined plane, which makes it easier to move up objects upward. We use a longer path, but then it's going to have easier lifting, less force required. We have a screw, which turns rotation into lengthwise movement. And we have the pulley, which makes lifting heavy weights easier by redirecting the force so we can get an assist from gravity. All right, guys, hope you have a great day. Take care of yourself. Stay healthy, stay, healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.